you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Put your mouth. OK, here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Hello, good evening. It's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. The Tory party is facing electoral oblivion at the next general election, according to a new YouGov poll, which suggests Conservatives could be heading for a repeat of the 1997 Tony Blair victory. Is this a surprise when a separate poll has revealed nearly 90%, 90% of constituencies want immigration to be reduced? Meanwhile, a new biography of His Majesty the King has suggested the late Queen was outraged over the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's decision to name their child Lilibet, a direct contradiction of their claim that they had Her Majesty's blessing. Plus, the final poll has set the scene in the Iowa caucus, with Donald Trump miles ahead with 48 percentage points. It seems no matter how much legal warfare he faces, it merely emboldens his core vote. State of the Nation starts now. I'll also be joined by a sagacious panel this evening, former Brexit Party MEP and Connection Annunciata Rees-Mogg and the author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me. You know this off by heart by now. Mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's time for the news of the day with Polly Middlehurst.
Jacob, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the Conservatives' election campaign director has tonight accused the backers of a major new poll which predicts a heavy Tory defeat of throwing in the towel. 14,000 voters, a larger than usual sample, were asked about their political intentions should there be a general election. The poll was commissioned by a group of Conservative donors and carried out by YouGov and it predicted the Conservatives are facing an election wipeout, retaining just 169 seats as Labour sweeps to power with a landslide. But Isaac Levido tonight at a 1922 committee meeting hit back at the polls, unnamed backers saying they were intent on undermining this government and the Conservative Party. Meanwhile, Rishi Sunak is facing growing pressure from right-wing MPs to toughen up his Rwanda bill with more crunch votes this week. Tonight, the party's deputy chairman, Lee Anderson, has confirmed he'll join a possible rebellion, saying he'll vote for amendments to the bill. The Tory divisions come as new figures reveal more than 200 migrants crossed the Channel in small boats just this weekend. In an exclusive interview with GB News, the Prime Minister saying the Rwanda scheme is still the deterrent the UK needs. Your heart breaks when you hear these stories about people dying. They're being exploited by criminal gangs and that's why we've got to resolve this issue. There's lots of reasons why and we should talk about them, but one of them is that innocent people are being exploited by criminal gangs. That's not right. There's nothing compassionate about it and, in fact, the compassionate thing to do is to tackle illegal migration and that's what our Rwanda scheme will do. I've been Prime Minister for a year, just over, and in that time we've actually reduced the number of people coming here by over a third. That hasn't happened before. No one else has managed to achieve that. Rishi Sunak. Well, Patrick Christis will be interviewing the former Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick on his programme tonight on the Rwanda Bill. That's on GB News tonight from nine o'clock. Now, in other news today, girls were left at the mercy of paedophile grooming gangs due to failings by senior police and council leaders in Manchester. That's according to a comprehensive new report covering nearly 10 years of failed investigations by Greater Manchester Police. It highlights years of widespread, organised sexual abuse of children in the Rochdale area despite what it described as compelling evidence reported to the authorities as early as 2004. Former police detective constable Maggie Oliver told GB News today she's pleased to see the report, but it is too little too late. It is the truth, but it's not a truth that was new to me. What makes me feel so angry is that it's taken 12 years to get it formally documented. And this isn't just a report. This is about lives destroyed. This is about children who have been criminalised, children who have been blamed, abusers who have been allowed to continue to abuse and go um, unchecked. And finally, Yemen's Houthi forces say British warships and vessels are now legitimate targets, irrespective of any ties to Israel. A spokesman for the militant group said any new US-UK action will see the region's seas not go unpunished. It comes as Rishi Sunak accused the Iran-backed group of being reckless after another missile struck a US-owned vessel off the coast of Yemen and last week's joint US-UK strikes launched on two rebel targets. That's the news on GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel. Two revelatory polls appeared in today's newspapers. And although they were conducted separately on ostensibly different subjects, they're inextricably linked and intertwined. The first, conducted by YouGov, has suggested the Tories face electoral oblivion, retaining a mere 169 seats at the next general election, handing Sir Keir Starmer a Tony Blair-esque majority of 120. I hate to say, almost inevitably, the data suggest every red wall seat won from Labour by Boris Johnson's electoral victory in 2019 will be lost back to Labour. This is reminiscent of Tony Blair's landslide victory over John Major in 1997, in which he secured a 179-seat majority. The other poll, however, that didn't make the front pages, seems to explain, at least in part, the risk of a forthcoming electoral disaster for the Tories. This research, commissioned by the think tank Onward, run by the estimable Sebastian Payne, 
has revealed that 90% of constituencies would like to see immigration reduced in the UK. Here's the picture that tells a thousand words. The red constituencies are the ones who want to increase immigration, while the blue constituencies are the ones who want to reduce it. If only this map were showing Tory Labour seats in red and blue. But perhaps, even more importantly, these data suggest that the British public underestimate the rate of immigration by a tenth. The average respondent believed net migration last year was a mere 70,000, when in reality, net migration for the year to June 2023 was 675,000. What does this tell us? Well, that the public believe that net migration is more than 10 times higher than it ought to be. And this has thrown even more light on the gulf between the political class and the people of the United Kingdom. If this poll to coincide with the electoral poll is remarkably convenient because it answers any questions the Tory party may have. The British public were promised that immigration would be brought down from the hundreds to the tens of thousands in 2010 and in 2015. They then voted in favour of Brexit, especially to regain sovereignty of our migration policy. This hasn't happened. People are feeling dissatisfied. There's a Rwanda bill before Parliament at the moment. The Tories need to deliver on this and deliver on this urgently if they'd have any hope of re-establishing trust with British voters. As always, I want to hear from you, mailmog at gbnews.com. Joining me now is a former minister in the governments headed by Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, Bill Rammel. Bill, thank you very much for coming in. Delighted. Um, migration clearly is a bigger concern to voters than Westminster politicians have been willing to accept for a long time. I, I don't think that's the case. If you look at the trend of polls, yes, it's an important issue, but the biggest issues are the National Health Service and the economy. And that's why and I take nothing for granted. You know, a year is a long time in politics, a very, a very long time. But I think it's looking likely that there's going to be a Labour government and it's looking likely it's going to be one with a large majority. And I think Conservative MPs are misleading themselves if they think this is just about migration. Yes, the government's got an appalling record on migration, 745,000 net migration, three and a half times the figure it was under the last Labour government. But it's about much more than that. It's about the chaos of five prime ministers in eight years. It's about the biggest tax burden since the Second World War and, and the unfairness that goes that with that, with billionaire non-doms paying nothing in tax whilst everybody else is paying more. Well, the non-dom system has actually been tightened since the last Labour government, as you know perfectly well, uh, and that non-doms are movable so they can go elsewhere if they don't want to pay the tax here. But they should but pay the, the tax. But they should pay economically, the tax, Jacob. Economically, um, the inheritance in 2010 was disastrous, that the country had run out of money, and then there was COVID, which cost £400 billion. This has all had to be paid for, and I think the electorate understands that. I think the question with immigration is that the Conservatives promised to do something about it and haven't, and that Brexit gives us the power to do something about it, and it hasn't been used. Well, the inheritance in 2010 was because of the global banking crisis. And, and, we, and we went into that with the lowest debt to GDP ratio of any G7 country. Yeah, yeah. So I think you overstate the case. But, but yes, the Conservatives have broken their word on migration. You know, for a party that was committed to reducing net migration to the tens of thousands, and it's 745,000. That's very serious. That's a manifest failure. But, but they're not serious and practical about reducing migration. It's about with respect, stunts like the Rwanda bill, but, and, but which if you, won't work. But if you look at the detail of the poll in the Telegraph, the YouGov poll, where are the votes going? And a very large number of them are going to reform mm. and to abstention of people who were strongly pro-Brexit um, and who want things done of what you might call a traditional Conservative type. They're tempted by reform because it's promising what the Tories said they'd do in 2019 and isn't actually happening. Well, if you, look at, if you look at the history books, this is what happens when you have a change of government. In 1997, huge landslide for the Labour Party, 179-seat majority. We actually took, I think it was 500 or 700,000 votes less than John Major had in 1992. So when parties lose because they're out of touch with the electorate and particularly out of touch with their base, a lot of their supporters stay at home. And this is very interesting, isn't it, that there's remarkably little direct switching between Labour and the Conservatives or Conservative and Labour. It's differential turnout, and the task for all parties is to get their vote out, which is why the government needs to motivate its base, which is why delivering on something like Rwanda is important, because that's what the base Conservative vote is expecting.
Except I still think, and, and there are switches. I mean, in my, I there, still, there are some. I, 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 yeah. I canvass regularly in my former constituency of Harlow, and I regularly, every week, come across switches. But I think politics and elections are still won in the centre ground. And I think if the Conservative Party goes in the direction of just appealing to that narrow base, you'll not only lose, you'll lose even bigger than you otherwise would have done. Well, it depends how you define the centre ground. <clears throat> if you see this poll, 90% of people want immigration controlled more, and they think it's a tenth of what it is. I, so, I, I want immigration so control. Centre, this is chaos. The centre ground is actually for a rigorous migration policy. The centre ground is not for the liberal migration policy we've had for the last 25 years. But it's for a migration policy that worked. Go back to the last Labour government when I was a minister, uh, and I'll acknowledge before about 2003, 2004, asylum numbers had got out of control. We then were relentlessly focused on reducing the numbers by returns agreements, by processing the backlog, and they'd come down significantly by the end of the Labour government. Well, but as you know, as you may remember, um, that the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, mm. then called for that to happen, and the other end of the system, all the resources were taken off deporting prisoners at the end of their sentences. So the balloon was squeezed one way and expanded another. But even more importantly, the numbers coming in from the EU weren't even properly calculated. So we discovered once we'd left that we had three or four million more people in the country than we'd anticipated. But, so but, migration was out of control. It was just but, a different but, part but, of but migration. But those East European mi migrants were hard-working people who were coming here to do the jobs that were necessary within the economy, and they brought greater economic growth. Now, I recognise well, that's hot, an hot, argument that's not been well made, but that was the reality you, of the situation. But if you look at the ABR forecasts for the migration that we're getting, <clears> the 700-odd thousand, mm. 1.4 million over two years, um, they say that adds to the total GDP, mm. but GDP per capita is declining, and that the Treasury study uh, on migration only showed that migrants didn't take more out of the benefit system than they paid in tax. It didn't look at the costs of hospitals and of schools and of infrastructure that is a net cost of migration to the economy. And you need a balance. Look, I believe that you need some migration to make the economy function effectively. I most certainly do not believe that net migration of 745,000 is sustainable or desirable. I agree with that. Where do you think it should be? I think, I think it's difficult to say. Certainly much lower than 745,000, and that's why you need the Migration Advisory Committee with teeth and power to properly recommend. What are the, what are the skill vacancies that we've got? What are the job vacancies that we've got? You know, the care home sector, um, where, you know, people are at real risk it, without migrants that, coming into well, the country. Well, up to a point, because we get lots of migrants coming in claiming they're going to work in the care sector who then go into other employment. Yeah, but go into any care home. But, you know, my parents ended up in care homes, but and, the, and, and they were populated by yeah, migrants. But the care home issue supporting. is that we're not paying people enough to work there. Absolutely, and whose fault is that? Well, We've had a Tory government for 14 years. But they weren't paid more under the last Labour government. It's been a constant problem of, uh, of social care. But, but, but there's been cuts to the training programme to go into social care, and there's not been effective enforcement. And, you know, we had a national minimum wage, we've now got a living wage. I think the government, the state, needs, needs to take greater responsibility could, to enforce higher I, wages. I think there isn't this group of English people, British people, who won't do jobs. I think they won't do jobs they're not properly paid for. And that we've relied on a drug of cheap immigrant labour that has had very profound consequences for our economy uh, and unfavourable ones. Unfortunately, I've given myself my last word because I'm just being told in my ear I've got to finish. I'm sorry. Next time you come on, Bill, we'll give you the last word. Good. Um, thank you very much. Coming up next, we'll be getting into the details of how the next election could go if the Tories don't get their act together. Plus, did the Sussexes mislead the public over the naming of their second child? Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. 
GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. I'm still Jacob rees -Mogg, and this is still State of the Nation. We've been discussing Tory electoral oblivion, something I hope we can avoid, owing to the failure to tackle mass migration, and you've been sending in your views. Steve says, Jacob, it's true they will be wiped out, but it's your own fault. Sunak should never have been there. No comment. Dave, typical former Labour minister doesn't understand the working class want immigration stopped. And Johnny... Those disaffected by the inaction and machinations of the Conservative Party are too intelligent to hand their vote to an even more woeful lot in the shape of Labour. Just saying. Well, we can continue with this subject because it's a fundamental matter for the Conservative Party and indeed for the future government of the country. But can the problem really be solved by pursuing Conservative policies? Is that an amazing thought? And if this vacuum is left by the Tory government, will it be filled by my GB News confederate Richard Tice with the Reform Party and even potentially Nigel Farage. New polling revealed that Reform UK's presence could cost the Tories as many as 96 seats. Well, someone who's repeatedly pointed to this vacuum uh, is the Professor of Politics at Kent University, Matt Goodwin, who joins me now. Matt, thank you very much for, for joining me. Um, no doubt you've been poring over this poll. Do you think if a Conservative government had Conservative policies, dealt with migration, cut taxes, shrank the size of the state, it might win back some of those voters who've gone to reform or who um, are now deciding to stay at home? Well, good evening, Jacob. I certainly think that the party would have a chance of winning those voters back. If you look at what's happened to Boris Johnson's voters, those 2019 Conservatives, the largest number of them have not gone to Labour or reform. They've gone into apathy. About a third are now saying they're not going to vote, they don't know who to vote for, or they simply refuse to tell pollsters like me uh, what they're going to do at the election. Now, what is their top priority? When we ask them, what would you most like to see the government prioritise over the next year? They say stop the boats, uh, stop illegal migration. They put that even ahead of the cost of living crisis and the NHS. So what you've got, I think, essentially now is a Conservative Party that has come adrift from its core 2019 voters. And look, if you're being a pragmatist about this, Jacob, you know, there's very little chance, I think, that the Conservatives are going to win back the university towns and the big cities at the next election, maybe over the longer term. 
But right now, in terms of minimizing losses, in terms of actually taking the fight to labor on these issues to do with illegal and legal migration and also crime, by the way, I think it's a no-brainer. I think the conservatives have to return to that traditional core message. They have to deliver uh, on the Rwanda bill, and they have to try and re-establish a relationship with those voters. And do you think this is what the government's trying to do, or do you think it's, in fact, still trying to win back the university professors who you mention by following slightly more um, lefty policies that it hopes they might um, welcome? And it, you take the green issues as well, that the um, government promised to change the green issues, but then actually all its action has been as green as ever. I think there is some desire within the Conservative Parliamentary Party or sections of the party <clears throat> to get serious about these issues. But what would concern me as a political strategist, Jacob, would be the briefings coming out from people who have worked with uh, Rishi Sunak who say, look, actually, he's not really that supportive of a hard line on illegal migration. I can say I've had conversations with cabinet ministers who have said to me that they don't view legal migration as much of an issue, uh, whereas we know that many of those conservative voters really do think the level of migration in the country, uh, whether legal or illegal, is an enormous issue. I mean, one of the standout statistics today for me in all of the things that I've read is that the average estimate of the level of migration into the country among voters is 70,000 people. The reality is it's closer to 700,000 people. So you have a real disconnect here. So to me, that says, well, if the Conservatives turn up the volume on this issue, if they make it clear to voters just what is happening, and they just put this prospect in front of voters of saying, we are going to pass this Rwanda legislation, we are going to have an effective deterrent, we're going to make sure it works, we're going to close the legal loopholes, and we're going to prioritise slashing legal migration, it's us or Labour, make your choice. I think that would actually get some of those 2019 Conservatives off the sofa into the polling station and say, you know what, I don't actually trust Labour on this issue of migration. I think it's the only card that Sunak has to play, to be honest. Well, it seems the obvious thing to do to go back to the people who have voted for you once before. They're the easiest pickings, you would have thought. Anyway, thank you very much, Matt. Um, as the Prime Minister addressed the House of Commons this afternoon, News emerged that yet another missile hit a US-owned ship off the coast of Yemen. And all it really did was reinforce the cause of the Allied powers taking action against the Iran-backed Houthi rebels. More than 10% of world trade passes through the Red Sea, with crucial imports like liquefied natural gas and oil being key commodities going through it. As long as the Houthis pose a threat at this trade, shipping insurance will rise and the cost will inevitably pass on to you. Also, people will take other routes that take longer, again increasing costs. The Houthis claim they are acting in solidarity with the Palestinians, but like Hamas, they are willing to sacrifice their own civilians for their own perverse worldview. Yemen is a pretty destitute country that suffered years of famine, with 90% of its food coming from imports. The Houthi disruption in the Red Sea is causing the cost of food for Yemenis to rise sharply. Well, with me now is former Brexit Party MEP and kinsman of mine, Annunciata Rees-Mogg, and the author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Um, Amy, the history of the UK government's involvement in big or little wars in the Middle East is not an encouraging one. Do you think this one is justified? Do you know what? I think it's comparing this to those previous wars, which is making people a lot more quick to judge. I don't think this is a war in Yemen because that suggests that there's been a mass of civilian deaths. The reason people have such problems with the interventions in Syria, in Afghanistan, um, in Iraq, is the civilian impact. So far with this, it seems to me that the retaliation was inevitable. Um, it got to the point where UK citizens were on those ships that were passing by, not military ships, commercial ships, and they were being targeted by these rebels. And I think at that point we had to defend our citizens. Um, it was a targeted attack, incredibly carefully executed. And I think it was proportionate because there was... A, um, in the run-up to taking the action, which I don't think was taken lightly at all, um, 
it, well, there was a lot of diplomacy involved, and I, and I think it became there wasn't any other options on the table. So so far, I would say it's proportionate. However, where I need, where I feel we need to go from here to keep the public support is it is easier to escalate something than de-escalate it. And I think the only way that we can continue with that is by addressing de-escalation in Gaza. Um, at the manner in which Israel is conducting their offensive in Gaza, I think I have a big problem with. So it is possible to see why this needed to happen in Yemen, see why this, why we needed to take those military strikes, whilst also recognising that what's going on in Gaza needs addressing. And I think David Cameron has expressed his concerns about what's going on in Gaza. The, the two things can exist at the same time. You can support this military action while completely condemning what's going on and the manner in which Israel is conducting itself in Gaza. But, Nunziata, what's the issue with Iran? Because um, Hamas is backed by Iran, the Houthis are backed by Iran. Is this all proxy warfare between the UK and Iran, or is that over-interpreting it? I, I personally don't think and haven't seen any evidence for the Iranians wanting all-out war with the UK, the US and the rest of the allied world. However, I think they do want to keep make sure we're on our toes and kept busy so they can get on doing what they want to do. And I think we have got to make sure they can't keep getting away with funding terrorist organisations because it amuses them. Well, you say the rest of the allied world, but most of the rest of the allied world hasn't turned up. <laughs> Some good countries have. Uh, we are not alone with the US on this occasion. And this war is deeply justified. I'm not entirely sure it is a war. I think the Royal Navy have been acting as protectors from piracy on the high seas for hundreds of years, and that is exactly what we are doing. And you mentioned that 10% or over 10% of world trade goes through the Suez Canal. It's over 30% of container ships go through. The cost to the Western world, to all nations, in fact, if the Houthis were able to cease transportation through that strait would be huge. Some people hear that and they hear stuff and they imagine, oh, it's our commercial interest, IKEA, next. It's not. It's medical supplies. It's, it's energy. It's everything. Absolutely. Exactly. The domestic consequences of not eliminating that threat would have been grave. Also, the Yemeni population themselves rely entirely on imports, so near entirely. And that's a population of 35 million people with an average age of 19. We don't actually want them to starve to death themselves. But the Houthis seem to have no care for their own population. No. no. And this is why I was so astounded to hear people at the Palestine protest on the weekend saying, Yemen, Yemen, turn those ships around and supporting the Houthis as if they haven't got enough Muslim blood on their hands and completely um, missing what who they are and what they're all about. Um, and that's why it's been frustrating to see. Obviously, they're linked because the Houthis say that they are doing it in protest of Gaza. But then it's, it's not automatically but like... But, go on. Isn't this extraordinarily symbolic of the divisiveness of what's going on at the moment, that people are supporting bad people because they think that um, other bad things are going on? To your point in, in Gaza, they think things are happening in Gaza which are um, uh, affecting Muslim people and therefore they want to support the Houthis. And this is a weird world view from my point of view, but it's an extraordinarily divisive one within the UK. But I think it's important to completely um, see them as two separate entities because the Houthis, in, a, in essence, are more aligned with Hamas. And we've said from the start, Hamas is something to be condemned and we'd like to completely eradicate them. Nobody's in, in um, any, uh, any disagreement with that. However, it's the Palestinian people that we're supporting. And we can I'm still criticise... I'm afraid a lot of people in the UK are deeply against that. We have seen people on marches supporting Hamas uh, explicitly, um, not just condemning that innocent uh, civilians are being injured and killed, but actually supporting Hamas. And not this supporting... is part of the division that Iran is very, very happy to see sown in the West, and it is set part of exactly the same the, issue. The reason the majority of people are marching is against the collective punishment of the people in Gaza. And it's giving the perfect cover for people who do people support are, people are now more likely to die of starvation than the bombs in Gaza. That that's where it's got. But then to, to now bring up the the fact that you could su support a terrorist organisation like the Houthis is, is absurd, I'll admit. But I, that's not why the majority people of people are, are conflating a lot of things and two bad two wrongs do not make a right, which is what a lot of people are muddling together and coming up with completely the wrong 
answers. What we've got to do is get rid of the terrorists and their sources but of funding. But the manner of which we do I, that... I, I, uh, sorry, Amy, I, I allowed my kinsman the last word. Actually, <laughs> Holmes, you always gets that. the last word. Um, <laughs> thank you to my panel. Coming up, yet another case of royal controversy emerges as a new biography alleges mistruths made on the part of the Sussexes. Plus, I may have cracked the real cause of Blue Monday. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Welcome back. I'm Ian Jacob rees Morgan. and this is State of the Nation. We've been discussing Houthi rebels disrupting freedom of navigation and you've been sending in your views, actually you've been sending in your views on the earlier topic. John says, in order to stand any chance of winning the next general election, Rishi Sunak must stop the illegal channel crossings and take immediate steps to reduce legal immigration. Well, I agree with that. And Paul says, I think the government failed to understand that migration is the biggest issue voters are concerned about. If I had a choice of where my taxes were spent, then it wouldn't be on five-star hotels for illegal migrants. Well, Paul, I think a lot of people agree with that. A new biography of His Majesty the King has revealed that our late sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II, was infuriated by the Duke and Duchesses of Sussex's decision to name their daughter Lilibet. She apparently said, I don't own my palaces or my artwork, but the one thing I have is my name, and they've even taken that from me. Prince Harry and his wife have previously claimed that they obtained the Queen's blessing to use her childhood nickname for their second child. However, one of the Queen's former aides told Robert Hardman, the author of the excellent new book Charles III, New King, New Court, that the late monarch was as angry as I'd ever seen her over the announcement casting the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's previous assertion that the Queen was supportive into doubt. His latest royal row reminds me of when 
their royal highnesses, as they once were, were given an award for taking the, quote, enlightened decision to only have, only to have, we can't have split infinitives, uh, two children, which means I should get three awards for having six children, three <laughs> times two. We're doing our maths here live on GB News. Um, but now my panel is with me, Annunciata Rees-Mogg and Amy Nicole Turner. Um, Amy, this is um, extraordinary, isn't it, that uh, they should have wound up the late Queen and then said oh, it was all approved? Well, I'm just frustrated with this story coming out because this child's about three or four years old now, yet it's the front page of the Daily Mail newspaper today. So my question is, what are they trying to distract from? Could it be another royal? Could it be a royal who the Queen paid £12 million on behalf of? Could it be to cover up the Prince Andrew news? Which I think is the real royal news at the moment. Um, why are we talking about this? Because it's interesting and it's exciting, not isn't it? And it's in a new book by Robert Hardman, which will soon be available from uh, all good bookstores. And I am so fed up about hearing about the Sussexes. I was thinking, gosh, I hope we don't have to discuss them. But on this subject, I feel quite passionate. Names are very personal. Uh, someone once asked me to change my name to a nickname that my best friend had happened to have given me as a, a young child. And it was a complete affront. That my name is part of my identity. It does belong to me. It is unusual. The Queen's Lilibet was unusual. And that was part of her identity. And taking that from her without her full, wholehearted blessing really is an affront okay, to the well, Queen. You, the Queen as usual is right. If I must engage then, I've got to say, the, the Queen always had the chance to question the names of royals as they were born into the family. And interestingly, it's alleged that Princess Beatrice was actually called the name Annabelle, and then they took it to the Queen, the Queen um, disapproved it. So I really don't Can think, you imagine without the, the Queen's all, blessing, the this child would have been called have the caused If the poor Queen had dared to say no to them, I think people said yes to them far too often in their lives. It's a lovely thing, I, them I, using a I, family I, name. I'm I, quite intrigued by this question of the Queen being as angry as anyone had ever seen her, as Her Majesty, Her Late Majesty, seemed to have complete and perfect self-control, as any lady should. <laughs> Do you think that was that she simply raised one eyebrow and that was an indication of absolute fury? I just think of all the things in that family that the Queen could be furious about, this probably didn't make her the most furious. I, 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 I I think sometimes that the really big things make you desperately sad and it's the little things that really do make you most annoyed. It's a and I can imagine the wonderful Queen having the most stony stare imaginable that would make people quake in their shoes and possibly a raised eyebrow. But I don't think she ever needed to shout. I doubt Did her you know the Queen's shout. grandfather named a horse after her, Lilibet? Lilibet, a racehorse. Well, he was the and king. And she was fine with that. Yes, of course, Everyone he was, was the fine king. with that. And so I think they'll see this as a compliment, which it is. But if, you, if, you're, if you're the king, you're allowed to name things after what you like, because you're the king. That's well, a great point of having a monarchy. Like your own children. I have to say, for someone that didn't want to talk about this, I certainly have. You've got a lot of... You've had business <laughs> by such pleasure to have you on, because you've got strong opinions. <laughs> anyway, the Prime Minister's got another headache. He needs to take aspirin. Um, as another poll... Yes, there's been another poll today has revealed that three-quarters of Conservative voters are opposed to Rishi Sunak's net-zero plans for boilers and cars. The polling, once again, serves as a reminder of the Prime Minister of the work to be done <clears> this year. Of those who voted Conservative at the 2019 election, 74%, and I'm one of them, opposed the gas boiler phase-out, and 71%, I'm one of them too, were against the petrol car ban. These results reiterate what we already know. No one votes to be poor and cold, and the rush towards net zero needs to be rethought. Well, Nunciata, um, this goes back to the point that Matt Goodwin was making. If you want to win elections, the best thing to do is to keep your coalition of voters together. And more than that, it's not just three quarters of Conservative voters who oppose these ridiculous measures, and I, I'm number two. Um, it's 55% of voters that if you want to win elections, don't go against the vast majority. Isn't this obviously true? And he said he wouldn't do it in a grand speech, much fanfare, probably state trumpeters borrowed from the Queen on parade um, last September. So he wasn't going to do it, and he's doing it all. Um, I disagree with you, and here is why. We have voted to become cold and poor, because six million people are living in fuel poverty, and if we just look at the facts of every time we well, have rode back on green policies, I'll give you three examples, and it has raised bills. Cutting the green crap, according to David Cameron. So we did. He reduced subsidies on, um, on renewable infrastructure. He said bills would go down. They went up. He 
cut onshore wind. He said the bills would go down. They went up. And thirdly, he cancelled home insulation. He said it, the bills would go down. They went up. But Tried and tested. Not green sure, crap works. What we, what we didn't do. And I apologise for use of foul language for people of <laughs> particularly sensitive hue. I'm quoting our foreign secretary. Uh, no, Nancy Artis wearing last week, you swearing this week. <laughs> I know it's becoming a bawdy Sorry. house in here. Um, but um, uh, if we'd done fracking, we would oh. have had a cheap and secure supply of gas not dependent on dictators. Would you want fracking next door to your house? Yes, I would. I don't believe no, I'd you. I'd love it, particularly I if I got um, a so, disruption payment for it. Also, Absolutely. wouldn't fracking take 10 uh, years to be any good anyway? Uh, these measures clearly make life more expensive. And to give you just a real-life example, yesterday my husband had to tow a horse in a horse trailer. He did it with a 21-year-old uh, Land Rover that has been retired to the countryside because Sadiq Khan uh, banned it, so we bought it very cheaply because it can no longer reside in London. I don't think it's necessarily in London, but in the countryside, they're very useful. They cost nothing, but we're keeping it going rather than extracting rare earth minerals, often through slave labour, through prisoners, through children. Uh, we are not causing all the energy to be put into creating a new car. It goes a very little difference. If we had to replace that with an electric car, the cheapest model you can get that could tow that is £70,000. It would cost a huge amount to keep going because by putting anything on the trailer, you half its range and therefore double the cost to run it. It is completely illogical to be running it off gas-fired uh, stations producing electricity anyway. Where is the sense in that conceivably? And how does it not make people poorer if they can't move around? Keeping old things going, make do and mend, rather than raping the earth in order to produce new goods that will end up scrapping old ones. But you know that it is an inevitability that we are going to have to go ahead with all this stuff, so why not let us be world leaders? Why not let us get ahead, create green jobs, create energy security? Look at all the problems that have come from depending on fossil fuels that aren't... that are imported. That has been a shock to the system. That has risen our bills. And, and there's so much potential here to have prosperity and security. We were well, talking about the Houthi rebels. We, we wouldn't are, have to depend well, on that shipping I'm lane. In I, North I, hold on, I'm all in favour of keeping old things going because I'm still here, so thank you to my panel. Uh, coming up, time is ticking away in the United States at the Iowa caucus, with Donald Trump expected to blow his fellow Republican candidates out of the water. We shall see. On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., I am back with a bang. The former immigration minister, Robert Jemrig, gives his most honest and defiant interview to date. All immigration is good, that diversity is strength. I think that's wrong. The Rwanda rebel let rip on the government's failure to stop the boats. My advice to the prime minister is you will not succeed unless you adopt this very robust mm. approach and then we will let the public down. And in a mammoth week for Rishi Sunak, Jemrig has piled the pressure on. We've done three failed bills in three years. It's three strikes while you're out. Robert Jemrick unleashed on a special Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m. Be there. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here 
for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. We've been discussing the revelation that our late sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II, was irritated that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex named their daughter Lilibet. And you've been getting in touch with Mel Moggs. Karen says, of all the nefarious things that the Sussex two have done, I think stealing Her Majesty's name was the most despicable. So cruel, mean and unnecessary. Absolutely love the show. Happy New Year to you all. Happy New Year to you too, Karen. But Martin is more with Amy. Who cares what her name is? Really a pointless exercise in wasting airtime, in my view. Well, Martin, I hope at least you stayed on to hear your male Margaret out. Uh, David, although legally the Sussexes did nothing wrong in naming their daughter Lilibet, I always thought it was their lowest act to pounce on the Queen's recently identified private nickname like a pair of jackals and endow their daughter with it. In 1863, as I'm sure you all remember, one Mrs O'Kane visited the well-known promiscuous Liberal Prime Minister... Palmerston in the House of Commons. Later, her husband divorced her and cited her affair with Palmerston as a cause of their divorce and claimed £20,000 in damages. The case against Palmerston, who was then nearly 80, was swiftly dismissed, but perhaps more importantly, the scandal significantly boosted his popularity. And that story perhaps best embodies the former US President Donald Trump, who is expected to win the Iowa caucus, which is taking place today, with a final poll placing him in first place with 48% of the vote, well ahead of the other candidates, such as Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy, despite facing countless criminal and civil cases, including some that could be comparable to Lord Palmerston's scandal with Mrs O'Kane, it seems his popularity continues unabated. Well, I'm joined now by a friend of the programme and chairman of Republicans Overseas, Greg Swenson. Greg, thank you for joining me. It is fascinating... The more he's in court, the more he's accused of, the more popular he becomes. You accuse him of sedition. And everyone <laughs> says, marvellous, let's have a seditious president. It's, it's not despite the indictments, though, Jacob. It's because of the indictments. That's, that really has bumped him incredibly in the polls. Back, back in March and April, he was basically tied with Ron DeSantis in, uh, as far as support in the polls go. But after the Alvin Bragg indictment, he immediately went from 45 to 60 and 15 points of resentment against the weaponization of the justice system. So it, it's really worked for him. And DeSantis had a pretty poor campaign, hasn't it? Looks like he might come third, may then pull out. It, it looks... In, he's polling number three right now at 16 percent. So he's had a rough couple of months. But this, all again, all started with the indictments. I don't know that his campaign had any major missteps. You know, that he, he's done everything right. He got all the, the big endorsements from both the evangelicals as well as the governor of Iowa. So he's done really well with endorsements. The campaign, of course, a few missteps, but I wouldn't call them any major blunders. All campaigns it, it, have that. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the indictments. But Nikki Haley coming to the fore? Yeah, she's had a good few months. She did well in the debates, so she was able to get some of that never-Trumper vote 
that was split okay. amongst the other candidates. You know, um, Chris Christie and who's pulled out. Yeah, you know, Mike Mike Pence. So you know that that's helped. But the last make, debate was pretty dire, wasn't it? it? Was With them horrible. both just shouting at each other, la la, pants on fire. It's, it's, nobody wins in that kind of war, and and I think that they they should they should have kept it a little bit more polite because they're only hurting each other here. They're not taking votes away from Trump when they do that. So, you know, the only chance they had I, I, ultimately is to consolidate. It, one of them has to drop out, and it all depends what happens tonight. And if Trump is much below 48%, that would damage his campaign expectations it, are pretty high. It would, yeah, because his, Iowa's always about momentum. You know, D Mike Dukakis came in third in, in uh, 1988, Dick Gephardt won, and Mike Dukakis went to uh, New Hampshire the next well, week. I went to yeah. a Democrat caucus in 1988, and I was there was... with great supporters of uh, Dukakis. Funny. Uh, and it's absolutely fascinating yeah. because... He was expected to come in fifth. Uh, and, but the process, it wasn't for the Democrats a ballot. People moved from room to room right. for who they were supporting. They argued with each other. Yeah, Friends said, right. no, come and support Dukakis rather than so-and-so. Uh, and it's a really interesting process. It really is. It's different than a traditional primary where you just do your secret ballot at any point during the day. You can mail them in. There's no mail-in voting. They're all in a room. You can campaign. You can send your surrogates. And I think even the candidates will be at some of the... You have to be there in person. Yeah. And you have a discussion right. before you vote. That's right. It's very raw democracy, it's isn't school. it? Yeah, it's really traditional. And I think it's a great system. But, you know, it, it's and again, it's all about the momentum. So if, if Trump comes way under 50, it'll look like he disappointed, even though his numbers okay. are sky high. There's never been a, a non-incumbent ca candidate polling this high. He's even higher than George W. was in 2000. Which, um, uh, but he's a sort of quasi-incumbent, right. isn't he? Right, and, and that's a great point, Jacob, because incumbent presidents should be polling at 90 in their own party. So now we have two incumbents, mm -hmm. or an incumbent and a quasi-incumbent, Polling in the 50s and 60s, not a good sign for both. For either of them. It's going to be a fascinating year with lots of elections coming up. Uh, thank you, Greg. And finally, we touched on a few coincidences in this programme. The coinciding of two separate political polls that seem to explain each other. More news of US ships being bombed off the coast of Yemen amidst the Prime Minister's Commons announcement. And, of course, the similarities between Donald Trump and 19th century Liberal Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, who, in brackets, is one of my great heroes. But perhaps the most poignant coincidence of today is it's not only Blue Monday, widely considered the most depressing day of the year, especially by travel agents, but also that it's National Pothole Day. Now, I don't think this is a coincidence at all. Indeed, the AA released new data late last night that potholes are a five-year high. So is it no wonder that we're so depressed we are plagued by an epidemic of poor quality roads? If I were a conspiracy theorist, I would think it was merely the latest strategy of those waging the war on the motorist. Anyway, thank you again to Greg. That's all from me. Up next, it's Patrick Hello. Christie's. Um, what's on the bill of fare tonight, Patrick? I've got an exclusive with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick, his first big sit-down interview since he quit his role. He does not hold back. We've got a surprise late edition in the shape of Lee Anderson and Brendan Clark-Smith, who are coming on at 9pm. I wonder whether or not they are going to resign from their roles in the Conservative Party. And we're going to be talking about British Pakistani grooming gangs and the problem that we have there. Well, Lee has put his name to the amendment and he's a deputy chairman, so that's an unusual thing to do, an unusual breach of collective responsibility. Yeah. But it seems to me he's standing up for his constituents. Yeah, well, possibly. Look, we're going to hear from Lee at 9pm, so we'll have to watch this space. Oh, well, that's going to be very exciting. I think everyone's going to be tuning in to hear um, all your interviews later on. Uh, I'm going to be coming back tomorrow at 8 o'clock. I am, as you may have guessed, Jacob Rees-Mogg. This has been State of the Nation. And in a moment, we're going to the weather. I have a feeling it's cold, but in Somerset, it will be a glorious and beautiful cold that you will all enjoy. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Very good evening to you. I'm Alex Burkill here with your latest GB News weather forecast. The cold theme set to continue and so it will stay frosty and icy at times with some snow showers too. But there is also the potential for some heavy persistent snow across northern parts as we go into Tuesday in association with a weather system currently towards the northwest of the UK. However, as we go through this evening and overnight, it's going to be cold. It's going to be frosty. We will see further snow showers feeding down on a brisk northerly wind, so particularly across northern Scotland and anywhere 
are exposed to that northerly wind, that's where we're most likely to see the snow showers. Elsewhere, further inland, largely dry with some clear skies, and under the clear skies, a widespread frost, coldest across parts of Scotland, could get into negative double figures. As we go through Tuesday then, for much of England and Wales, and actually a largely fine day. Again, some winter sunshine around, but further north, the potential for some persistent snow to push in across parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, and particularly across Scotland, could see more than uh, 10 centimetres of snow, perhaps, and so that could cause some significant disruption. Again, it is going to be a cold day, temperatures a little bit below average for the time of year. As we look towards Wednesday, and there is a feature towards the south of the UK, currently likely just to stay to the south of us, but the potential it could bring a bit of significant snow to southern parts of the UK. Further north, looking largely dry, plenty of winter sunshine again, but some snow showers for far northern parts, perhaps. Later on in the week, likely to turn dry and temperatures lifting a little bit too. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday night.